to achieve you know, our mission at Mailman in building a healthy and just world. So um, before we jump into the first question that I have, um, we're gonna begin with introductions. And let me just share at the end of this um, panel discussion, there will be an opportunity um, for you as students to ask questions um, for our panelists. We have some microphones that have been set up here. Um, and we also are gonna have someone um, in the balcony um, with the microphone to help um, uh, share the questions that students um, above might have. All right, so let's begin with introductions and I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Patrick Catcher. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm Patrick Catcher. I'm a professor in the Department of Population and Family Health and I use he and they pronouns. Um, I've been at Columbia for five years and most of my career as a public health physician was in public health practice. So my role in the core is one I'm particularly proud of and it's one I share with all the other panel members. I teach uh, or more accurately facilitate the integration of science and practice portion of your core experience. It's the one uh, aspect of uh, your first semester experience where you'll be meeting in a group of uh, around 20 students from across multiple departments, facilitated by a faculty member and teaching assistant, usually from other departments themselves. And we confront issues of, uh, of historical importance and significance in public health and try to understand uh, the, the complexity that was at play at those times. And we turn our lens on contemporary issues and look at how the uh, the role of public health is evolving and how it can best be wielded uh, to impact society and to achieve justice. Thank you. Heather. Hi. Oh, it's working. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Heather Butts. I am an associate professor at um, an HPM, Health Policy Management. I, I've actually been in the Columbia system for a while. So I've only been a full-time faculty member for about a year and a half, but I came to academia kind of in a little bit of a roundabout way. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, so um, after doing my undergrad work at Princeton, I went straight to law school uh, and then I went to public health school, but then I was working. I I was a consultant for several years at Price Waterhouse Coopers, and I worked um, for the government for a while. And then I was an administrator here at Columbia, uh, and was got my uh, educational degree at night while I was working during the day, and then sort of transition to teaching kind of slowly. Uh, so it's been kind of a journey for me in terms of that process. And in terms of um, sort of what I think about teaching and how I integrate it, oh, pronouns she, her, hers. Um, what I think about teaching and, and how I integrate that, a lot of my thought process around teaching really has to do with the background that I have. So. I run a nonprofit called Health for Youths that works with underserved young people in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And we work with 91 partner organizations and about 7,000 youth every year. And so a project that we did uh, that you can see and <laughs> grab a Clementine from is in the student lounge. So if anybody's been over there and you see this little stand that right now has about 10 clementines because i checked <laughs> it's new um but uh the nonprofit that work with we we within the isp class integration science practice just what patrick was talking about that we um were doing one day a group of students came up with the idea and we actualized it and now it's we started it in april of 2020 at the very beginning of covid came up with the idea basically the last class we were in person and now it's running three and a half years and we bring fresh fruits and vegetables to bodegas and corner stores throughout the city. We now have 12 of them and um, are hoping to expand. So that's kind of a, a, I'll talk more about another class I teach untold stories, but that's a good idea of sort of how I function and how I see the classroom uh, and what I hope to bring to the students that I work with because it's very rewarding for me. 
and I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing? Are you awake? Uh, Christian Gloria, Associate Professor of Sociomedical Sciences and Deputy Chair of the Department oversee the master's programs. Um, how many hats do I wear? Uh, I'm the MPH Certificate Director for the Certificate of Health Promotion Research and Practice. I also teach in the core in the first couple of weeks, I think week two and three, I'll be teaching uh, some uh, modules on health promotion theory. And uh, in the fall semester, I teach the master's thesis course, I teach in the core, I teach in ISP and in integration of science and practice. Uh, and in the spring semester, I teach a couple of courses or more than a couple of courses in health promotion theory and designing public health interventions. And uh, the second sequence of the thesis course for the master's students. Uh, I'm also the director for uh, what we call the Region 2 Public Health Training Center. It's federally funded by the U.S. Uh, Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. The center receives about $3.2 million every four years. And, and essentially, our mission is to provide continuing education and professional development to current uh, local health department public health workers uh, and region two includes uh, the states of New York, New Jersey, as well as the Commonwealth and territories of Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Don't ask me how region two ended up becoming those four places in the country, uh, which is uh, challenging, but also very fun in terms of just the diversity. Where in New Jersey, New York, a lot of our trainings are in English. Uh, in Puerto Rico, it's in, all in Spanish. And in the US Virgin Islands, it's all kinds of things. Uh, we're just about to uh, build more relationships and partnerships with the USVI. It's all very new. Uh, so really looking forward to extending our work there. Uh, a lot of the webinars, or sorry, a lot of the trainings that we offer to public health workers in the region are uh, on webinars, on online asynchronous training. Sometimes we'll do it in person. And after talking with Heather a little bit earlier today, I might have to explore adding adding podcasts as part of our training menu. Do it, do it. Um, go by the pronouns, by the way, I forgot. Uh, he, him, his, or hey, girl, hey. Um, <laughs> I'll respond to all of those. And, and I've been with Columbia for, I can't believe it's only been two years. It feels like I've been here a long time, and I mean that in a good way. And, uh, and prior to moving here to New York City two years ago to join the Columbia family, I had been a faculty uh, at a public health department at the university in, in Hawaii. Uh, and I was there for 10 years. Uh, and prior to Hawaii, I had been uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, where I stayed there for like a dozen years, getting my bachelor's, master's, and PhD in health education and public health. I think that's enough. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're incredibly blessed to have each of you here at the Columbia Mailman School. You know, so one of several reasons um, I was attracted to Columbia Mailman um, and to the Vice Dean of Education position um, was our bold vision, right? Um, of building a healthy and just world. And I was especially attracted to that justice piece. So my first question is reflecting on our grand rounds theme this academic year, a healthy and just world, what would it take? I would love for um, each of you to share what justice means for you and, and how you see justice playing out in the work that you do. Jump right in, anyone, before I call on you. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll start. Um, I think, just like you, Michael, I think I was really attracted to the justice and advocacy legacy here at Columbia Mailman. Um, like I said, I worked in global and national public health uh, agencies and public health practice for a while. And while many of my colleagues at CDC and the World Health Organization were motivated to pursue global health because they really believed that health is a human right, and they really believed in advancing uh, social justice as a means to achieving public health. We end up getting caught up in the science and the day-to-day -day management issues and, uh, and uh, the reality of our tasks at hand, and we hardly ever say that again. We hardly ever acknowledge that what motivates us is really a values-based uh, interest in public health. And for me, that's where the justice emphasis comes. In the Department of Population and Family Health, we had the opportunity to revisit our vision and mission, and we want to center ourselves as a values-based 
and practice driven uh, public health program. And for me, the values are the justice piece of it. But in my undergraduate classics course, I remember learning that the Roman poet Horace said, fidelity is the sister of justice. And I'm not sure I really understood that as a 20 year old undergraduate, but what it means to me now is that's the piece of our practice-based work. So achieving justice, achieving policies and systems that confront and overcome uh, inequities, uh, calling out power that's unjust, all of those agendas are things that are really important and advance our values. But it doesn't mean as much in public health terms unless we're faithful to those values and work just as hard to translate them into realities, to achieve the health gains, to achieve the actual access and uh, rights benefits that uh, our discipline promises. Uh, I mean, th that's a fabulous answer. I, I probably would would sort of hitch a ride to it and say, um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, invited to come to this Girl Scout cookie sale <laughs> uh, in Union Square. And uh, sometimes with my nonprofit work, people suggest that I go to something because it could be interesting for the work that we do. So I went and it was a group of unhoused Girl Scouts um, that were raising money for their troop. And so I uh, was talking with one of them and I, I kind of said, you know what, this is pretty fascinating to me that you're taking the time to do this, um, you know, given that you're unhoused. And she looked at me and she said, well, why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't I? We all have something to give. I said, oh, well, that is that is right. <laughs> um, but then I started to think about that story and I said to myself, but how can we make things easier for a 12 year old unhoused young lady to be able to do all of what she wants in the world? Um, so she's out there giving the best she can, but uh, there's something that's that's not equitable here. And so that's what really fuels the work that I do around the nonprofit that I work with. I mean, I, in a lot of the students that we work with um, are court involved uh, and have just had difficult, they've had a difficult stepping place to get to where they are. And so the ability to be able to work with populations of people who have not been afforded uh, the kind of advantages that other have, others have been afforded um, and thinking about what we can do to um, deal with that is my life's work. And so to the extent that this is a space that I've always felt that I'm able to do that work and actually, I mean, even before we started, I was talking with Dean Joseph, he's like, you know, don't forget about your helpful youth work. I was like, oh, I won't. <laughs> so the ability to know that people in senior administration want you to be able to do that kind of work and encourage it. I mean, that's uh, that's a gift as an academic, at least it is to me, so. I'll let you ride on the wagon also. I don't know what to add to that, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for me, justice, I would define it as, I know it's overly simplistic, but certainly my ideal in the work that I do and all of the work that we do in public health are uh, of course, reducing disparities uh, making sure we enable equity across all kinds of communities. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, at least from my experience, working with all kinds of communities in my work, it, it's most of it boils down to sort of access, access to quality education, access to qual quality health care, uh, accessible and affordable is really what I mean, uh, access to the resources that they need, like a lot of my sort of on the nights and on the weekends side gig, when especially when I lived in Hawaii, where there was a culture of, uh, especially among first generation families, a culture of you go to high school, you finish high school, you get a job right away, full time job, work anywhere, and that's it. Like uh, <clears throat> the thought of going to college, let alone community college, is just not part of the family's script, right? And 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 that resonated with me because that was sort of the pressures that I felt growing up where community college was probably the dreamiest we could be because first of all we couldn't afford it 
Um, but I was a stubborn kid. I said, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to find a way to do it. And thankfully, uh, around somewhere in the 90s, so I don't even know when, I was like 16 or 17. And I think I had my very first laptop, access to internet, access to all kinds of unlimited resources, uh, both good and bad. Um, and I found a way, <laughs> I found a way on how to go to college, on how to apply, uh, how to do FAFSA. I actually was a year behind going to college compared to my peers because I needed the year off as a first generation immigrant to figure out how to go get my higher education. So I watched my high school friends go through it for the first year so I can learn it vicariously through them uh, and then figure out not only how to navigate the system, uh, but also figure out how to afford it by applying for loans, et cetera. Um, and my secret to all of my friends and family at the time was, oh, I'm just not ready to go to school. I'm, I'm still figuring it out, but really I was just poor and I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and thankfully, you know, through through the internets and my friends and all of the other organizations and the schools and the teachers, I, I, I took it upon myself to just access everything I could find and, and look for things that I didn't know were in existence, but I kept looking until I found them. And so the ingredient to my success was just resources are everywhere. We just, in many cases, don't know where they are, or we don't have the time and the capacity to try to find it and get there. But I was stubborn. So I think that's what they call grit in psychology. And so uh, and so that really has inspired me in all of my work, uh, especially with similar communities where I'm looking at all of these families with otherwise brilliant and outstanding children who, again, have no dreams of ever going to college. And so I would work with them and sometimes house to house, family to family. Uh, even if the parents are not supportive, I'll go talk to them and be like, hey, you know, I can help you get your kids to college. I can help you figure out how to do FAFSA and, and get student loans and, and scholarships and grants so you can afford it. Because I have, and I'm such an academic where I really value education. I've always wanted to be a teacher. I knew that it was an active ingredient, a secret ingredient to having the knowledge, the skills and abilities to take care of yourself, to take care of the people around you, take care of your communities and make right choices to promote health and equity, um, whether it's educational or healthcare. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and if I just take a stab at that same question, you know, what justice means to me, I have to reflect upon, you know, all of the pathway program work um, that I'm so just, uh, it's, it's such a blessing to be involved in that work. And these are pathway programs designed to steer, you know, um, you know, students from historically excluded and socially disadvantaged backgrounds into this amazing field that we enjoy, public health. You know, so um, I, I see that as justice. I see that, and what's so rewarding for me is whenever I teach, let's say, you know, I've had, I had a middle schooler um, who I ran into, she was a middle schooler way back when, um, but is now, you know, working at the CDC. And when I was at the CDC recently, I actually ran into her and she was like, I remember you, Dr. Joseph, and you taught me biostatistics. And that's so rewarding for me. Mm -hmm. When I see students, um, you know, who are here at the Mailman School, students who I taught in these pathway programs, and now they're here and getting an opportunity to get this top notch, you know, top ranked public health education, you know, that's part of justice for me. Um, you know, I, think, yeah. I just want to, I just want to uh, applaud you on that work because, um, when you came here, one of the things that you said from the beginning was that these pipeline programs, these pathway programs were instrumental, and then you led by example in terms of those. So uh, that's important, I'm sure, to everybody up here. We've all talked about it in various ways. And so I say thank you, too, for that, because it's the way that a lot of young people are able to get to some places which otherwise they would not be able to. No, and and I, I I firmly believe that if if students are good enough to get into these you know highly regarded pathway programs, they're good enough to get into the mailman school and also thrive and succeed while they're here at the mailman school. So that's why I'm I'm such a firm supporter of these pathway programs. Maybe if I could tag on to that or hitch on to that a little bit too, I think there's an aspect of our pursuit of justice that challenges us to be advocates and activists. Um, and sometimes that's a very awkward posture to take when you're sitting in 
a bastion of uh, entrenched power and privilege that is Columbia University. I think what we also have the unbelievable privilege of being able to think about and do is how we wield the power and privilege that come with our institution's brand name. And I think that uh, what you've done with the pathway programs, which you've done and your students have done in the communities, what so many of our faculty do with their partners um, is to bring the Columbia name and attention to individuals, organizations, and settings that otherwise would continue to be overlooked. Well, thank you. And, and you know, so to, to get into the next question, you know, we've been talking about justice, but um, if you look in today's society, there's so many injustices, right? And um, when I think about injustice, I have to think about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963, he said an injustice anywhere right, is a threat to justice everywhere, you know, and that quote is so relevant uh, today, considering, again, um, you know, all of the injustices that we see, and, and and considering that there's so much to do, whether that's locally, whether that's um, nationally, and, and globally, to address these injustices that we see in health and in well-being, so my question is, from your perspective, um, how can we invest in and deliver public health, either locally, nationally or globally? Patrick, globally. Sure. Um, globally, I think uh, I think for me, trying to uh, practice a global health career in a way that uh, that is informed by uh, my values of dismantling systems of oppression. Um, I think that, that that's taken time for me to learn and I'm still figuring it out. Um, so much of the work in global health is still driven by uh, biomedical research institutions in the Europe and North America and supported by uh, donor funding from US, European and other countries. It's only starting to happen that we're beginning to have a shift in, in more of that kind of funding and resources, both for the science and implementation, moving into the hands of in-country partners, ministries of health who have the authority uh, to meet the needs of their people, and research and service organizations that are homegrown in the communities and countries where we work. I'm really privileged uh, to just get back from a visit to Tanzania where I worked early in my career. Um, I was a federal employee, but I was seconded to a, a local research organization called the Ifakara Institute or the Ifakara Health Institute. Um, I was there with a research program and we were the first uh, we were the first international group who worked with the Ifakara Institute, aside from the Swiss uh, who had established the Institute as part of their own uh, training program for Swiss nationals. So under new Tanzanian leadership, we brought the first international project. Um, and I've got to see how that institution has grown and how individuals have risen from, uh, I, I recall somebody who was who had started as a local high school graduate and started as a lab assistant who eventually got doctoral level training and was the, the chief executive officer of the Institute until a few years ago. Um, I've also got to see that uh, policies have slowly shifted so that the major US government uh, award for malaria for the next five years isn't going to a Beltway Bandit or a university here in the United States. It's going to the Efikara Health Institute and they'll contract uh, the external technical support as they need it. So for me, being able to be part of that transition um, and I think, you know, maybe more broadly, all 
people say all politics is local. Certainly all public health is local, even global public health. Uh, and so recognizing that uh, you have to work with local institutions, local people, whether they're formal institutions or informal ones. Um, and I think uh, I think that's how we engage. Heather or Christian? Sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I really love this question. I So I, I think I'll answer it. It's interesting. I'm a lawyer, so you'd probably think I'd answer it in a lawyerly way, but no, no, no. <laughs> I don't exactly go for it. No, I, well, I mean, I guess tangentially I will. Um, so when I was um, a younger, I saw this movie called Glory, which I, I say it now, and a lot of people have never heard of it, but it's a movie that came out years ago with Denzel Washington. He won his first Academy Award for Glory, actually. Um, and Matthew Broderick and Carrie Always and Morgan Freeman. And it's about a group of African-American soldiers that served during the Civil War. And I remember I saw, saw it like eight times. I just, I think I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't believe I was seeing this movie and I didn't know this part of history. I mean, we don't know everything, obviously, but it just, every time I watched it, it just shocked me. And uh, then I went to college and I was a history major, doing no small measure to that. It just struck me too that we don't know our history. We don't know where we've come from. It's very difficult to get justice. So it's very difficult to be able to um, sort of, sort of, put your stake down and say, you know, this is this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to be done. So um, I just couldn't sort of shake that. And so I ended up at public health school, kind of so kind of how you are now. So I'm in public health school and I got to do this paper for some class. <laughs> and so I pick the topic of African-American soldiers health care during the Civil War. And I stumble upon this gentleman named Alexander Augusta, who, from what I saw, said surgeon. I said, well, that's not possible. They must have been soldier. Did more digging. There were 14 surgeons, African-American surgeons that served during the Civil War. Anybody know that? Yeah. Well, you didn't read my book then. <laughs> I wrote a book about it. Um, so there are 14 of them. And so in doing that book and doing the research, it really, it really put a... Um, uh, a stamp on me in terms of thinking about how much we don't know about our own histories and how much we don't know about what has come before us and how many times we repeat things that we shouldn't. So it led to me starting a class called Untold Stories. Uh, and so shameless plug, uh, Untold Stories is a class. I teach an HPM in the spring and students get to pick their own untold story to talk about. And it's a whole range and students can tell the story however they like podcast uh one of our students uh, just got an article that he wrote about uh safety net hospitals in brooklyn published uh you can tell it in terms of video TikTok. <laughs> we haven't done that yet but sure why not um and so students get to pick their own story and tell it however they want to so to me that really sort of gets to some of what we're talking about in terms of you know, on a global level, on a local level, telling stories that matter to you that have not been told or have been told incompletely. And how do we, how do we tell our stories? How do we share our stories? What does that look like? That's exquisitely important to me. And so that would, that would be how I would answer the question. And the question is how do we invest in public health locally, nationally, globally, right? Um, and going along with with you know what others have said, uh, and I'm a squeaky wheel about this. I get ulcers about this every day. Um, when I look back at the, or when I look back and when I look now at sort of the American education system, and that's not unique to America. It's like all over the world where we just don't have any investments to health information as a part of our education system. Um, the first time I got super loud about it was when I was faculty in Hawaii. And at the university, they were revising the general education program, the courses that were required for all undergraduate students. And they were going to do away with the health courses. It's like, how dare you as the chair of public health department? How, it's probably the first time in my life where I wanted to flip a table. And I said to the round table of 20 veteran faculty members who are a member of the, the, the curriculum committee, how dare you take away 
health education, health information, when, when all of you are suffering from health problems and all of us will die from health problems, I'm, I'm so worried that we are growing American adults and adults all over the world who get into adulthood not knowing how to take care of them of their health, of their individual health, of their family health, of their kids' health, their neighborhood, their community, society, et cetera, right? And I feel like it's such an easy solution I love that we focus on STEM. STEM is important. That helps us with a lot of discovery and development. And I feel like we know so little about our own health and well-being. Um, and so I would love to be able to see if we want to invest in public health and prevent a lot of problems that we're seeing now uh, is let's, let's grow a citizenry, a population of people. Uh, from the very beginning, from kindergarten, elementary, middle school, high school, college, where health courses are actually required that you, uh, as far as I know, in many high school curriculum to get your four-year high school diploma, you might get like a half semester of a health course taught by, and nothing against them, taught by a historian, right? Who are playing video uh, VHS cassette tapes back in my days and, and just showing you a video on STDs and call it a day, right? And so when I help people in, in achieving their dreams of being healthy individuals, healthy families, healthy communities, it breaks my heart that we have to start with the very basics, yeah. right? Like yeah. something as simple as when I recommend eat a healthier diet, what does healthy diet mean? They would ask me, is broccoli healthy and why? Um, and it again resonates with me about how we just don't have any investments in public health education <laughs> and we should because it costs a lot um, individually as a family, as a society. Right. And I love how we have an accredited public health program uh, in the United States and globally. I'm helping my home country in the Philippines also develop accredited public health programs because we don't have public health. Everything is just reactionary uh, medical doctors and nurses who go out into the field and promote health the way they know how to promote health. But nothing is preventive. Um, and we can certainly uh, get the most bang for our buck if we can just keep our people healthy. Like I, I was I was almost into med school uh, and I'm thinking, no, I don't like dealing with sick people. I want to keep them healthy. <laughs> well, you know, another um, thing that really attracted me to the mailman school to jumping into our next question, um, in addition to this bold vision statement that we have, I was really intrigued by how much of an emphasis Columbia Mailman puts on interdisciplinary. Uh Right. And and as students, you're going to see that heavily next week as you're fully immersed in the core. Um, you know, Patrick mentioned, you know, the learning groups that you're going to be in and those were strategically kind of built. Um, you're going to be interacting with um, students from all across the different departments here at the Mailman School. Um, but it's really the core is an opportunity for you to not just learn about public health, but also to apply you know, public health in these interdisciplinary um, settings. You know, I was at an APHA meeting um, a couple of years ago prior to the pandemic and um, just navigating through the exhibit hall. Um, I never forgot, I forget, I saw this exhibitor um, that had a bunch of swag items on the desk and um, the items read or, or the, the printing on the swag item said, two heads are better than one, but two disciplines are even better. So with that being you know, said, you know, we know we, we um, really emphasize interdisciplinary research here uh, at Columbia Mailman. So can you share some, uh, some examples of collaborative um, research you've done in this regard and also how the research has benefited from that interdisciplinary um, effort? Heather? I mean, you know, it's interesting. I actually would have to try to think about how I haven't done interdisciplinary work. You, you, really have to sort of think about it for a second, right? Um, I mean, just sort of my own background, I've described it to you, you know, so I have a public health degree, I'm a lawyer by training, and then I have a master's in education, specifically psychology and education and clinical psych. So um, I, I myself obviously am interdisciplinary. Uh, one thing I failed to mention earlier is I'm the faculty lead for the leadership class. And something that I'm really proud of is we we have an interdisciplinary um, piece of the class uh, called the Community Spotlight, which everybody that takes the leadership class, which should be most of you, you will engage in. And the specific purpose of that is to give you 
training around working with people from other professions, other disciplines, other areas. Uh, you get to engage with other students who may be from other disciplines and other areas. Um, and that, and I think that, that that kind of commitment that the school has specifically to that grounded in a core course, leadership is one of the two core courses that you do your second semester, uh, that's impactful and that, that's meaningful. Uh, in terms of the research that I do, I mean, it's all interdisciplinary. I'm working on a research project now, um, taking the Clementine Collective project that I just mentioned and expanding it um, to look at uh, food security issues and food as medicine for uh, veterans, uh, college students, and uh, people that live in New York City housing. And so we're gonna be working with a group of students that are PAs. We're gonna be working with some law students. We're gonna look at a little advocacy. So for me, it would, it's it's kind of you know embedded in what I do. And again, I mean, I've either worked with or definitely want to work with everybody on this panel, including Dean Joseph. And that work is all very much embedded in, we're all in different areas. And so that should be telling in terms of uh, how we work and function here and how important that kind of interdisciplinary work is. Question or? Sure, question. and uh, exactly what you've said where I rarely ever work with public health people because right. I'm always working interdisciplinarily. I, I love working with other fields and other perspectives and to, uh, as we center around health, I, I always believe that it takes a whole village and a system to create problems, and it certainly will create, will need a whole system and a whole interdisciplinary network of people to fix the problems that we created in the first place. And so uh, a couple of my research projects and other projects that I do that are inter interdisciplinary and have always been, uh, so for example, I, uh, I'm, I'm about to embark on a new research project of Filipino nurses. Uh, during COVID, during the pandemic, out of all of the nurses who died around the world, a third of them were Filipino and largely in the invisible community. And so I'm working with some faculty from other universities, a faculty actually in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, faculty in nursing, faculty in psychology, uh, <clears throat> even people in bioinformatics uh, and all kinds of technology and IT stuff that I don't know too much about. Uh, and we combine forces just like what Dr. Joseph mentioned, right? Uh, I don't have to try to be an expert at everything. I'm bad at a lot of things. I'm good at one thing maybe, but I am really good at assembling a team of people who can fill in the gaps and the needs so we can really holistically see a problem, see the opportunities for change, small and large, and then create programs to fix it. Uh, another project that I'm doing in the Philippines is uh, mental health surveillance. Um, I think I mentioned uh, to, I, I think my department session the other day, where in my country, uh, the government finally, for the first time in its history, adopted a mental health law, a national mental health law in 2018, that finally recognizes mental health as a real thing. Uh, and so the beautiful thing about that law is that it, it opens up a whole lot of funding from government to support research, to figure out what's happening, and then more money to to uh, to build programs in schools and workplaces and in our universal healthcare system so that we can promote mental health amongst other health dimensions. And so I work closely with psychologists, with social workers, with, with nurses, with doctors, with government officials, uh, and everybody else that you can imagine around the system to again figure out where we can make these changes here and there. So holistically, systemically, we can we can be more effective and more efficient at, at, at addressing these kinds of problems. Yeah, thank you. And, and um, you know, we definitely preach and, and teach here to our students that in order to be competent public health professionals, you need to be able to effectively work in interdisciplinary teams. So, so thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna ask one last question before I open up the, the floor for the students. <clears throat> and I wanna end on a positive note. Uh, you know, we, we've been talking about <clears throat> justice and injustice. And, you know, at times it can be very hard, you know, just maintaining that passion and that excitement you know, that first attracted us to the field of public health, um, you know, because of the awful disparities that continue to persist um, in health and in healthcare and well being. You know, so um, my final question is, you know, what brings you joy, you know, in the work that you do? And what words of encouragement would you share with our students um, so that they can continue maintaining that optimism um, in their public health work? 
okay. Uh, I mean, I think it's probably going to sound corny, but it's all of you. Uh, I mean, I think I told the story about the Clementine Collective, which was born out of a class. And I remember when the students said it, I was like, <laughs> my, my, you know, I, I, it was just such a great idea. Uh, and, you know, the classes that I teach, they rely on students being creative. Um, another class that I teach is uh, public health ethics. And we got a grant uh, from the provost's office to be able to create a public health module for communities who are not versed in public health laws. So they're, they're, I get to use the law a little bit, right? Uh, and so we created a module and the students came up with ideas I honestly never would have come up with. It's, you know, that old phrase, like you, you can't think of what you don't know. You, know. you can't possibly imagine what you can't imagine. I just couldn't have imagined some of the ideas that the students came up with. And now we have a module in the world that people can use to be able to learn more about what public health ethics and laws and mandates actually are. So I would say it's all of you. And then my words of encouragement would be to, you know, be bold and be brave about how you work with faculty and how you think about problems and how you get it out into the world. Get it out into the world. Um, you know, one of the things that we do, we do in ISP is we talk, and in leadership, we talk a lot about power and positional power and what that looks like. Uh, but all of you have the power to be able to do incredible, amazing work right now. And so, be bold about doing that, I would say. And that that's what gives me um, an inordinate amount of joy. Patrick? I'd say, first of all, pursue joy in your personal life and let the career follow that lead. Um, and the specific issues of how do you find joy in, in work that's sometimes hard and where progress is sometimes slow, Make sure you celebrate the small and incremental uh, victories um, and that you occasionally take time to take perspective and look back at how many have accumulated and what direction they're, le they're leading in. I think I really liked Heather's point of getting out there into the community, into a place where, uh, where you're learning uh, as much as sharing your own knowledge. Um, and I think more than those of us up here, you'll have opportunities in your career to change direction, to change employers. In fact, you'll probably face the necessity of repeating, cha repeatedly changing your employer and your direction more so than we ever did. But see if you can I, identify something that you can focus on or a place where you can stay situated long enough to see substantial change actually happen. Um, don't just uh, look for uh, the next higher paying opportunity. Look for one where your contribution will progress, where you'll be able to witness uh, pro progress over time. And it can be remarkable how uh, what appears to be stagnant and slow moving uh, once you've accumulated a few years, uh, you can look back on and really, really appreciate uh, substantial change. And then finally, invest in the interpersonal relationships that you form with the collaborators you work with the best, the communities, the, the, the individuals uh, who are meaningful to you, because that is also a source a source of daily joy, um, even when progress is slow. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. And, and I would also share um, uh, something that I always share with my students whenever they're you know, feeling down. Um, Frederick Douglass says that if there is no struggle, there is no progress. All right, and I see that every time I'm teaching in Project Imhotep at Morehouse College, um, that's a quote that's uh, directly above the computer lab. Um, and it's so true, right? There's gonna be bumps in the road. There's gonna be some challenging times. There's gonna be some difficult uh, moments and hurdles that you have to overcome, but you have to persevere, right? You have to have that grit and that determination you know, that, that Heather always talks about. Um, and, and ultimately the progress will come. All right, so I'm gonna open up the floor. Um, we have mics here for those who are on the lower level. 
Um, and we're gonna have Kat go upstairs in case um, someone above has a question. So feel free, there's mics here. Ask a question. We have a brave soul who's going oh, to wow. the mic right now. All right. A plus. Exactly. You get a good piece. Hi. Uh, so thank you to all the speakers. Um, my question is actually entirely about the Clementines. Um, oh. I come okay. from a community health background, and we had a, a food, a fruit and vegetable pharmacy. But there were always these questions about, like, are we yeah. medicalizing this too much? Uh, yes. Is it really necessary for like somebody to write up a script for you to get like an apple and banana to take home? Right. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that um, you were using this space of the bodega to distribute fruits and vegetables. Um, so yeah, how did you come to the decision to use that space? And um, did you face any challenges yeah. around like, you know? Woo, yes. Um, so I love the question. You know, it's funny because when we first started Clementine Collective, I didn't think about medicalizing it. I just thought to myself, bodega oh, I don't know if you're not a New Yorker maybe you don't know what a bodega is so a bodega is a, I'm, I'm just we're just using the term right a bodega is like a corner store it's like a a, a band, yeah convenience store right like a 7-eleven but without all the 7-eleven stuff right exactly so <laughs> so so that's what that's what a bodega is okay so I mean when we first started honestly and remember this was three weeks into COVID uh, my honest thought was people need food. You know, I mean, I, I know it's hard to remember three and a half years ago, but, you know, back then people were very silent in terms of their movements, how far they could go away from their houses. So the first thought was like, people need something healthy, maybe near their homes and bodegas are usually very close to home. So let's do it that way. As it evolved, we started to think about how we could get health outcomes. That's actually, so we've done two studies. The third study, which we could chat offline, will be the most challenging is it's starting to get into sort of thinking about how we can learn the medical outcomes of eating. And it's not just Clementine, by the way, we, we give out eggplant, you're seeing eggplants and, and kiwi and we get requests. Somebody was like, I want some turnips. It's like, okay, we'll get you some turnips. So we got turnips at one store. And uh, so it's a lot of things other than Clementine's, but um, it's a great question. And really what we were trying to do was the contrast of bodegas that basically have potato chips and, you know, a lot of unhealthy things to get some healthier things in there and basically just sort of observe are people taking them with, with the under underlying theme being a lot of times the thought is that people who live in food deserts don't want the healthy food, which could not be further from the truth. It's just not accessible to them. Um, so that was all of our beginning thinking, but now we've, it's morphed to being more about like, can these fresh fruits and vegetables actually have health outcomes? So that's where we are now. So I would love to chat with you about it, you know, afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of, I was stuck on, I mean, the whole grand, grand round thing, but the quote from quote, um, Horace, fidelity is the sister to justice. But that's kind of, you know, how I interpret it is that, um, you know, that um, fidelity being, you know, because it's about being faithful. It's about being loyal. So is it that he's saying that public health is a dedication or a loyalty to the refinement of the human condition? And this is what we do as public health messengers. I'm saying that. That's my interpretive logic yeah. of it. But I would like to hear what you got to say in regards to fidelity being a sister right. to yeah. faith. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that the... Justice is the idea or the ideal, and fidelity for me is the follow through on making that real for people, making, helping to realize uh, that. So it's translating yeah. that value, that ideal into reality in people's lives. Yeah, I compliment you on that because I think that's, it, it, it makes all three days make sense in the sense oh. that everything that we've been hearing been about being kind and being 
um, considerate, the difference, right? And embracing difference so that we understand different people from different backgrounds in different parts of the world. And this is what we have here today. So thank you. Good, thank you. And, and if I could just respond to that real quick too, just to add to Patrick, uh, and I love how you conceptualize fidelity as you know a form of loyalty. And, and to me, it's being loyal to back to the community, back to the people and not being uh, influenced by all of the, uh, the politics that happen around health uh, that shouldn't have to be. And it's really going back to the people and asking what do you need and how can I enable your community to meet those kinds of needs and outcomes. Yeah, I just I just wanted to echo what everybody said. I think a lot of times and you'll as you go through your time here, it's kind of what Dean Joseph was saying. There can be times when it is difficult and it's hard to know why you're, you know, doing what you're doing when you are here. But then when you go back to what is the meaning of this and, and what is this grounding in? Then I think that that really answers the question. So it's a it's a great quote. And I, your interpretation to me is fabulous. I believe Kat has someone in the balcony. Oh, hello. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, as you guys, uh, in the middle. You can see us, but we can't see you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the light. Follow the light. Um, I guys, you guys mentioned that progress is difficult. And especially, I think, in public health, there's, they're kind of like these big topics. And sometimes there's a lot of outside influences, such as government and communities and these other influences that can define um, and maybe restrict progress. So I was wondering how you guys define progress and track progress. And I think um, carrying forward that mindset as students can be really helpful with um, the projects that we do. Uh, I mean, I, I, I realized with that question, I, I didn't answer one part of your question, which was, did you have pushback from the bodegas? The answer was yes, a big yes. I went into one bodega and the bodega owner, like he saw me coming with my Clementines because I, you know, I get, by the way, if you see me on campus with like a big old 30 pound bag of Clementines, yeah, that's me. That's me. Don't act like you don't know. It's me. It's me. <laughs> so anyway, I was walking in with this big old bag of Clementines and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I've heard about you. Like, you, no, 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 I'm not about it. Like, you're going to cut into my business. I was like, your potato chip business? Is that what I'm going to get into? And he was like, well, you know, we have things we have to sell here and we need to keep it how it's going. And I mean, interestingly enough, like a year later, we were in that store. <laughs> like we were in with the Clementines. He was like, come on in. We, we made it. it. But it took a year for him to see it happening somewhere else and watch the Clementines do well. And you don't cut into anybody's business when you're, when you're giving away free Clementines. If anything, people might come in for a Clementine and then they buy your stuff anyway. So you're enhancing the business. So yeah, you're going to, you're going to get that where you get a store owner that doesn't want to be on board with your project or governmental officials that can't see the vision, but that goes to then what everybody in this panel has been saying, where you, that's when you dig deep and the, you, the grit and you persevere and you keep going and you got to believe. I mean, everybody on this panel, these folks, like they believe in what they're doing. You've got to really believe that what you are doing is the thing to be doing. So yes. And that's when you dig real deep and you say this, what I'm doing, um, it's going to make an impact for myself and for those um, that need this. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, the one thing you said, uh, Heather, that's so important, but almost invisible all the time is progress is not necessarily just about changes in health outcomes and your targets. Uh, a lot of it has to do also with the building the relationship and the yeah. partnership uh, and the trust uh, that we're all in it together. I'm not here to, uh, to impact your business. Um, I did a nutrition environment study back when I was a master's student, uh, and we would go to all of the grocery stores and the, and the convenience stores and the liquor stores to assess what they have available, the quality, the price, et cetera. And we would get kicked out and sometimes forcibly. Um, and we're like, we're just shopping around to see what you have and then complement it with the farmer's market every week so that people in the community will have access to fresh produce uh, that's affordable and, and of high quality. And, and for me, progress is something that I deal with uh, that I have an existential crisis with on a regular basis, because I know that a lot of the work that I'm doing uh, will probably surpass my lifetime. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> a lot of the whole systems change that I'm dreaming about, about transforming the healthcare system around my home country or here in the United States, it's going to go way beyond my lifetime. And, and I know I made a joke the other day that I'm a vampire, but I'm not immortal. Uh, so the one thing I, I love about the progress 
especially as a faculty, you know, having the opportunity and the honor to train the next leaders of public health to carry on the torch. Uh, the one thing that I love uh, that I don't want to take a lot of credit for is, for example, when I was in, in Hawaii, I brought my freshman undergrad students to testify to the council members, to the politicians mm -hmm. about uh, this bill to increase the minimum age for tobacco products from 18 to 21, which had been tried year after year, failed. Uh, but the one time that I brought youngsters into the room, all of the politicians loved them, and I'd love to, and I'd like to believe that that was one of the main reasons why uh, the community was in the politicians and the people of power were able to support that bill, being making Hawaii the first state in the country to to raise the the age minimum age for buying and using tobacco products from 18 to 21. It's like wow, progress that we never thought would ever happen. Uh, but we got there just because we tried. So that's a good way to end this um, um, on progress. I know. So we do have one, one student, but I, I'm going to ask you to hold off on that. We're going to be available for the next half an hour. Um, we know that we have um, um, several events uh, still scheduled for you uh, today. Um, um, so I, I want to conclude by just um, um, thanking you for attending our grand round session today. But can you also join me in thanking these highly esteemed panelists for their contributions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Katcher, Professor Butts, uh, Dr. Gloria, thank you so much. Uh, 